So we're kind of leading up to precipitation. We've talked about condensation, and condensation at the Earth's surface can give us fog or dew or frost. Condensation within clouds begins with what we uh, talked about earlier in Chapter 5, um, little water vapors joining together around what we call cloud condensation nuclei. And as I think I mentioned, those cloud condensation nuclei are really pretty small. I'm not sure they're necessarily drawn to scale in this figure, but you can see they're 0 0.0002 millimeters, the cloud condensation nuclei, when they first form. A large cloud droplet is many times larger than that. So we kind of need to talk about how, um, how we get from something so small, cloud condensation nuclei, that initial condensation, that particle that is condensed, to something that's a little bit larger. And kind of at the crux of when we talk about ultimately rain, precipitation in the form of downright rain, it needs a certain amount of uh, mass, size, in order to fall as precipitation. So um, actually, kind of leading up to that, we're going to talk about what happens in cold clouds. Now, I kind of differentiate between cold clouds and cool clouds here in a little bit, but at the top of both cold clouds and cool clouds is the formation of ice crystals, okay? And that's kind of where I'm going with all of this. Oftentimes, um, at upper elevations, even though it ultim something fall precipitation falls as rain, it starts out as snow ice crystals. So it's really pretty cold in the upper part of the troposphere, but even as cold as it is, uh, one of the neat things about water is it can stay in its liquid state even below temperatures of 32 degrees Fahrenheit, zero degrees Celsius. That's the freezing point temperature of water. It will stay a liquid up there. And we call that supercooled water Supercooled water then just is water that's a liquid cooler than it should be. It's super cooled. And you might think be thinking, now how do how do you get we know we all know that water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Why wouldn't it freeze? And it has to do a little bit with the conditions under which that cooling temperature came about. Um, I've got some videos out there under the miscellaneous videos for chapters four and five, and they actually show this phenomenon of supercooled water. And you may have um, experienced it yourself if you have, um, oh, in your car, you keep um, a case of water, bottled water. Um, what's happened to me several times <clears throat> is that as the temperatures have fallen outside, you know, the outside temperatures are colder than, you know, below freezing. I'll go out to get my bottle of water and I go to open it up and it's liquid, but when I open, it's liquid before I open up, but when I open it up, it disturbs my super cool water and it freezes. So take a look at that. Um, so super cool water, oops, I was just going to say just a few more things about this. So super cool water is water in its liquid state. <coughs> at a temperature that, that honestly, it's just kind of itching to go ahead and solidify. It's go, it wants to freeze, but it's a liquid. That's the way I think of it. So then, for instance, if airplanes run into supercooled water, that water will go ahead and freeze on contact, freeze on the airplanes. Um, Supercooled water is actually, uh, we're going to talk about freezing rain here in a little bit, a player. So supercooled water is an important part of this uh, precipitation that happens at upper elevations. Uh, so <clears throat> think of it this, or here's another thing about supercooled water. Um, well, I guess this doesn't necessarily have to do with super cooled water, but if you have the same amount of, and you're going to see it on a picture here, how it plays into precipitation within clouds. Here's my water vapor, okay? Here's my puddle of liquid water, I'll put an L for liquid, and here is my ice cube, okay? This is a solid, of course, water in a solid state, and up here, this is water in its gaseous state. 
Now, <clears throat> if we have super cooled water, I'm going to put super cooled water, liquid water. If we have um, the water vapor up here at the saturation point at relative humidity is equal to 100% with regard to water being its liquid state, that same water vapor up here, actually, can you see, I'm going to go down a few, that's at zero degrees Celsius. Let's go ahead and make 100% relative humidity, super cooled water uh, relative to liquid water. Notice what, at that temperature, um, although it's 100% relative humidity relative to liquid water, it's 110% relative humidity relative to going from being a gas to being a solid. It's, it's, <laughs> this is what we call supersaturated, anything above 100% relative humidity. And this supersaturation is talking about how water vapor is going to go ahead and basically, what, deposit to become a solid. Okay, super saturated, super califragilistic. Do you see why we call that super saturated? Because the relative humidity is greater than 100%. So what this just means is if you have an environment, and we're going to see the slide here in a minute that kind of talks you through, if you have an environment where you have a certain amount of water vapor at a cool temperature, Okay, and you have liquid there, and you have solid there. What's and that liquid is super cool. Well, it has to be super cool because it's at these temperatures below freezing. Then you're going to basically get deposition. What is deposition? That is when water goes from being a gas, skips the liquid, straight to being a solid, and that's going to be our cute little ice crystals. So, air in the vicinity of super cooled water that is saturated. Uh, it's saturated with regard to water is also saturated, I would go ahead and say is oftentimes super saturated with respect to ice. Okay, Ber the Bergeron process, I'm sure that's French. <laughs> well, as I talk you through, and I, I think your author does a good job with having these, um, a, f a figure with three pictures kind of showing you the formation of snow, that's what we generally call the Bergeron process. And it, it counts on the presence of supercooled water. So here in a minute, you're gonna see ice crystals, which ice crystals would be solid, right? Solid ice crystals, where's my thing? Solid ice crystals falling through supercooled um, liquid and this is my liquid particles, and saturated with water vapor. Okay, and then what you're going to see is um, that that solid, that ice crystal, get larger. Here is a word. Uh, the word supersaturated means that it is more than 100% relative humidity, and we saw that with regard to solid water, with regard to ice, that we can have a supersaturated environment in which we have use has supercooled water. Okay, so like I said, the consequence is that the water, water vapor, will quickly deposit onto that cute little solid ice crystal that's growing. It's just amazing. And then if you look at um, a snowstorm or my one of my favorite snows are the ones where just the 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 snowflakes just gently fall down from the sky, and think of how much as we talk about the Bergeron process and the formation of ice crystals. Think how much work went into creating those ice crystals. So these are the the figure from your textbook with the three images kind of showing you time uh, throughout time how that little ice crystal grows. So uh, note with these three figures, the size of this would be super cooled, I think it's at the bottom there, super cooled um, liquid water. Let me see, liquid water. And it's of course these little boogers out here, this is our, our gas, 
our water vapor, and you see your little ice crystal. Now if you compare one to two, so this is time, as time evolves, what happens is our ice crystal gets larger and our supercooled water gets smaller. Okay. So um, as I said, the ice crystal is growing, which is basically going to be snow ultimately, isn't it? These ice crystals are, are growing okay, at the expense of get, uh, water vapor is depositing onto the ice crystal. And as gas, as, as water vapor comes out of the atmosphere, then what happens is the supercooled water goes ahead and replenishes, it goes ahead and saturates that atmosphere some more, and then they become smaller. I just think that's neat. So just kind of generally, we know that um, <clears throat> if you've watched, uh, kind of focused on uh, the individual snowflakes, we know that they come in different sizes um, and they have different densities. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. Um, some are fluffy snows, some are dense snows. But um, on their way down, the snow crystals can just become larger via a process we call accretion. And we use this, actually, the word accretion we use in astronomy, too, when the planets get larger, <laughs> when the planetismals ultimately pick up mass and um, become full-fed planets. But accretion is what we also say as that cute little uh, snowflake or ice crystal falls through the Earth's atmosphere. It picks up buddies and it becomes larger. Um, here in a minute, we're going to talk more about the different types of precipitation that ultimately fall from the um, fall from the sky. Even though it could start out as snow, we're going to see depending upon the temperature. And I'm sure this is not too hard to fathom. We'll talk about if uh, depending upon the temperature as it ultimately reaches the ground, then we'll either get rain, freezing rain, or sleet. We'll kind of talk about how the atmosphere's temperature gives us those different scenarios even though it starts out 